Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2022 National Ryan White Conference on HIV care and treatment section. Technical assistance overview, case studies, and evaluation findings from the enhancing linkage of SDI in HIV surveillance data spin initiative. My name is Sun Fan, uh, and I am a health scientist with, uh, within the HRSA HIV S Bureau's Division of Policy and Data, and I will be the mon uh, moderator. And my colleague Robert Mills will be the chat room monitor for this session. So today you will be hearing a presentation on these subjects from six speakers, including myself and Mary Springer, data integration specialist, Georgetown University, Tiffany Wilson, epidemiology senior, Alabama Department of Public Health, Barrett uh, Lam, Dep uh, Deputy Division Chief, District of Columbia Department of Health, Gallery Postman. The epidemiologist, uh, Florida Department of Health, Jessica Fritz, SDI HIV Hepatitis uh, Surveillance Manager, Louisiana Department of Health, and Jane Fox, Principal Associate, Art Associates. So uh, we thank you for joining today's section. As you participate in the section, please feel free to add your questions and comments in the chat box. Uh, as a conclusion of the section, the presenters will have opportunity to address your uh, questions. Uh, please click on the view on the top of your screen to see the presentation. So let's begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 National Line Wide Conference on HIV Care and Treatment. I am Sun Fan, a health scientist in the Division of Policy and Data, HIV S Bureau. So this is a joint presentation for the initiative Enhancing Linkage of STI and HIV Surveillance Data in the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program with a presenter from HRSA Hub, Georgetown University for State Departments of Health and App Associates. Next slide, please. So this is just a disclosed statement that all the presenters have no relevant financial interest to disclose. Next slide. Um, for this slide, uh, we would expect that at the end of our presentation, audience would be able to describe the six technical assistance focus area of the initiative, name three challenges to sharing and matching data encountered by the participating uh, jurisdiction, and describe two findings of the evaluation. Next slide. So I would like to acknowledge the participation and the contribution from the different teams that have engaged in this initiative, including our HRSA Hub team, Georgetown University, participating health department teams, and our associate teams. Next slide. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a joint presentation, and I will kick off our presentation with an overview of the the HRSA Hub Initiative Enhancing Linkage of STI and HIV Surveillance Data in the Ryan Y HIV Program. Next slide. So before providing the project overview, I just want to remind you about what HRSA Hub and Ryan Y HIV S Program are doing to provide services to people, especially people with HIV S. HRSA supports uh, more than 90 programs that provide healthcare to people who are geographically isolated, economically or men medically challenged. HRSA does it through the grants and cooperative agreements to more than 3,000 awardees, including uh, community and faith-based organizations, colleges, university, hospitals, state, local and tribal governments, and private entities. So every year, HRSA program serves tens of millions of people, including people with HIV AIDS, pregnant women, mothers, and their families, and those otherwise unable to access quality health care. Next slide. Oh, given the rapid changes in health care and the ending the uh, HIV epidemics in the U.S. initiative, along with the release of national HIV AIDS strategy, we refresh a half visions and mission the update ensure that uh, both our mission and vision are forwarding looking and acknowledge uh, the ultimate goal of ending the HIV epidemic in the US and what HAP needs to do to get there while continuing to provide the quality HIV care of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program 
blood current and newly diagnosed people with HIV need. First, our half vision is optimal HIV care and treatment for all to end the HIV, uh, HIV epidemic uh, in the US. Half mission is to provide leadership and resources to advance HIV care and treatment to improve health outcomes and reduce health disparities for people with HIV and affected communities. Next slide. For the HIV, uh, for the HAPS uh, Ryan White program, the Ryan White HIV program provides a comprehensive system of HIV primary medical care, medication, and essential support services for low income people with HIV. The program funds the grants to states, cities, counties, and local community based organizations to improve health outcomes and reduce HIV transmission. Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients determine a service uh, delivery and funding priority based on local needs and planning process. In 2020, the Ryan White HIV AIDS program provided services to nearly 562,000 people, more than half of all people with diagnosed with HIV in the United States. 89.4% of Ryan White HIV program clients receive HIV medical and care were virally suppressed in 2020, exceeding the national average of 65.5%. Next slide. So this, the HOSA HAP initiative is of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, HAP F, Special, Special Projects of National Significance, SPIN program. Next slide. Next slide, please. The main purpose of this thin initiative are to enhance the integration of HIV and STI uh, surveillance data with the Ryan White HIV AIDS data in order to improve linkage, re-engagement in care and health outcomes for people with HIV and to evaluate the effectiveness and impacts of the integrated data as a result from the project implementation. We fund Georgetown University as a project a technical and assistant provider, staff, and our associate as an evaluator for the project. And also, there are four funded uh, uh, jurisdictions participating in this project, including Alabama Department of Public Health, District of Columbia Department of Health, Florida Department of Health, and Louisiana Department of Health. The project timeline is from September 1st, 2019 through August 31st, 2022. So we are now in the final year of the initiative. Next slide. So the purpose of our joint presentation today is to describe the uh, technical assistance framework and activity, jurisdiction experiences and evaluation findings from this field initiatives. The agenda for the presentation includes the project overview that I have just provided. Georgetown University will provide description of their technical assistance providing the jurisdictions, and then the four participating jurisdictions will share the experience in the project implementation. Our associates will uh, present the evaluation findings, and we will end our presentation with the Q&A and discussion section. Next slide. This is just my contact information as a project officer for this initiative. Next slide, please. For the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, you can learn more about the program through the given links, uh, ryanwhite.versa.gov. And also you can sign up for the program listserv to receive the update from the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Next slide, please. So finally, you can also learn more about our, our agency, HERSA at HERSA.gov. Now I would like to turn it over to the Georgetown University. Hello, everyone. My name is Anne-Marie Stringer, and I am the Data Integration Specialist for the Technical Assistance Team at Georgetown University Center for Global Health Practice and Impact. So for this project setup, we started with a in-depth and collaborative needs analysis with the four participating jurisdictions. We use the results of this assessment to develop technical working groups within each jurisdiction to meet the goals found after the needs assessment. And then we also set up communities of practice, which took common themes across all 
four participating jurisdictions and created a collaborative where jurisdictions could share best practices across um, jurisdiction lines. The goals of this project were to improve HIV STI data linkages, um, and the purpose for this is to make sure that important health information are being communicated across programs, reduce redundant work where the same, both programs may be um, attempting to contact the same individual, um, and improves outreach for Ryan White, um, the Ryan White program and the Department of Health by having more accurate data to guide those outreach activities. So here's a breakdown of our project goals. Um, so the first part, the HIV STI data linkages, we're aiming to combine related data from disparate sources in order to gain insights that may not have been evident without integrating those sources, ultimately with the goal to translate data into meaningful actions. The next part is via a tiered technical systems approach. So not only are we talking about linking data horizontally within the Department of Health at the state level between HIV surveillance, STD programs, and Ryan White services, but also ensuring that data communication is going vertically down to the county health departments, as well as the care and service providers, such as the Part A programs and other um, community-based organization and care providers. And the final part, of course, the overarching goal is to improve Ryan White client outcomes by utilizing this data and this information sharing to optimize client engagement and retention processes to further progression along the care cascade with the goal of achieving viral suppression for all clients. So the structure of our implementation from the Georgetown side is, again, we began with an in-depth needs assessment survey. Uh, which we took the results of that survey to digest the information internally as the technical assistance provider and bring our findings from that survey back to the dur jurisdiction directly so that we can immediately engage stakeholders to make sure that we have in mind the a, a implementation plan that aligns with the priorities and needs of the jurisdiction. Uh, from there, we designed working groups with each jurisdiction. So within each jurisdiction, we had three technical working groups that collectively would reach the goals of um, that particular jurisdiction. Um, our implementation was tailored per state. So each working group would be different per state. But within each state, we had regular working group meetings and virtual technical assistance provision um, for each working group within each state there were champions identified that would be kind of the go-to contact person for that working group um, and and from there from beginning to work with each state really one-on-one -on -one, in the weeds hands-on we identified core focus areas um, that led to the development of our communities of practice that were not we're expanding on the work groups that were within each jurisdiction to have community practice meetings that were across jurisdictions. So overall, we're having a lot of engagement monthly and quarterly within jurisdiction groups, as well as inviting all jurisdictions to participate in the quarterly community of practice meetings. Um, some program successes for our technical assistance team. Uh, we drafted lots of data sharing agreements, starting with just the negotiation of uh, the parameters of the data sharing, such as what variables would be shared, what the process for data sharing would be, um, and help to draft these uh, documents for jurisdictions to allow for data sharing external to the health department. We did a lot of SOP creation, documentation of processes that had not previously been able to be documented due to a lack of staff time to dedicate to documentation, but SOP creation is really important for um, navigating staff turnover where if a staff person leaves, the process would need to be recreated if not for uh, solid documentation. A huge focus of the first year of the project was improving communication and collaboration between historically um, siloed programs or teams. Um, and this really set us up well for success later on in the project that we invested that initial effort to improve pathways for communication. Um, for some for some working groups, we actually wrote SAS codes or reviewed SAS codes. Uh, we designed data flows and streamlined data matching processes, both across programs within the state, as well as between the state down to county or um, Ryan White Part A or other provider uh, structures and restructured data pathways and systems um, and help jurisdiction determine the best way to store their integrated data, whether that be a data warehouse or transitioning to a different data system that has better capacity to hold data. 
So some challenges that we faced were in the initiation of the project, there were many silos that existed between these programs, again, due to just um, separate funding streams, creating separate priorities, creating separate communication structures. Um, so that was an initial barrier that we needed to overcome. There were also some legal barriers that we faced where jurisdictions were unable to share data um, outside of the jurisdiction, particularly in one state you'll hear about later, where the Part A's are actually a separate entity from the state, and therefore there was no um, existing ability to share data. And so we had to overcome a very strict rigorous legal review process in order to start this data exchange. Staffing limitations are pretty pervasive within departments of health, um, and that was only worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for the first uh, six months, we, we were able to travel, and then um, COVID hit and offices closed. We transitioned to 100% remote work. Uh, we had to cancel the majority of our year one site visits. Um, and we're not able to travel until the end of year two to the sites. Uh, a lot of staff were initially relocated to COVID pro project teams, COVID outbreak teams, um, because just the nature of being HIV, um, being an HIV staff were likely the ones with the most experience with contract tracing and other infectious disease outbreak um, management stuff. And then as all these, um, I've seen in many, um, I've seen in many offices across the globe. There was high staff turnover during the pandemic, um, both on our side at Georgetown as well as in the Department of Health offices, uh, which led to, again, processes being lost because not being documented, as well as we had to onboard new staff or the hiring process took a while. So all of these really posed big challenges for progress project progress in the in the early years creative solutions to address these challenges uh, we provided lots of training resources session focus on relationship strengthening in year one to address the limited communication so we definitely dedicated a lot more time to this than we had initially thought would be necessary but it definitely paid off in creating these um, relationships that would be the foundation for effective collaboration later on uh, we were very flexible as the TA provider with timeline and outputs. Uh, we adopted we adapted our implementation plan to um, be able to continue moving forward despite holdups due to staff absences. So just reassessing how we can move forward in this moment, given the resources we have right now, rather than having to stick to our initial plan pre-COVID. Um, clever workarounds for legal delays where we found ways with the jurisdictions to allow for data sharing initially while we waited for legal approval to do the ultimate what we had wanted to do for direct data sharing. Um, we got much more involved as the TA provider in writing SOPs and codes because that was the need. Um, we engaged much more frequently with the jurisdictions and but it had to be virtual, so we got really in the weeds with our TA while still maintaining that high level technical assistance to make sure that pro the project progressed to the higher level goals. Um, and then just constant meetings and frequent really weekly touch base with the jurisdictions. Next slide. <clears throat> so lessons learned in this project from our side was the flexibility of technical assistance allowed us to reduce pressure on jurisdictions. We didn't want anyone to burn out of the project during the COVID pandemic, but we did still want to make progress and we were able to do this. Uh, we found that energized leadership on the Department of Health side is really key to keeping momentum with this project. Communication is essential. Um, the extensive needs assessment at the beginning of the project really allowed us to create tailored technical assistance so that um, our implementation was really relevant to the state needs and uh, plan for the future rather than trying to do a one size fits all. Um, spending year one again to figure out priorities, tensions, and barriers was really important. We wouldn't be where we were if we hadn't dedicated that time initially hands-on support and really having our TA team be an extra set of hands where needed was allowed for project momentum throughout COVID. Um, creating collaborative plans with the jurisdictions and really not just applying a externally created implementation ex outwardly really allowed this to be much more sustainable because the 
implementation chosen were really along the trajectory of what the jurisdiction would have wanted to do anyway. We just allowed the timeline to fast track by being here to help move progress along much quicker. Um, learning that SAS knowledge or coding knowledge at the Department of Health level is really essential to do this kind of large scale data project. And finally, we learned that there is a way to make the remote virtual environment work for this project, although it did require a lot of restructuring about our initial vision of what TA looked like. All right, so now we'll move on to the next part of the presentation, hearing from jurisdiction experiences with this project. Hi everyone, I am Tiffany Wilson with the Alabama Department of Public Health. I am the epidemiology senior here in the HIV data management division. We have a long collaborative standing with our system and another system in uh, called ALMBS, which is in our STD division. Essentially, we have two different operating systems. We have the ER system that we use here in HIV surveillance, and then we also have the ALMBS, which is what STD uses, our STD division, I'm sorry, uses to collect HIV case investigations. Challenges that we faced is large scale case re reconciliation. Essentially, because we are operating in two different systems, it's kind of it's hard to transcribe information from one system into the other system sometimes. And it's also a little bit have I'm sorry, some hardships as far as trying to see what our true burden is as far as caseload because we are operating out of two different systems. We also don't have a way to capture negative labs and that obviously will help with our caseload as far as seeing who's a true positive versus who's actually negative. And then of course we have limited staff. So the goal of the project with working with Georgetown was to help develop a fully integrated surveillance system and to develop a data dashboard to enhance prevention and care outcomes. Next slide. So the goal was to develop two dashboards, one that would be public facing, that would show all of our data, incidents, prevalence, cumulative, in addition to our care continuum data, and an internal dashboard that would actually present us with real-time data as far as our um, HIV cases, where they're most prevalent at, and what kind of prevention services we needed to provide in those areas. We also wanted to develop a data warehouse, which would be an integrated patient profile. Right now, we have about five systems that we pull information from for one patient, and we have to log into each one of those systems individually. So to have all patient information in one system would be vital to us just being able to go in and look up one patient and see everything that we need at one time versus having to go into five different systems. We also wanted to develop a data sharing agreement with our community-based organizations. A lot of organizations work at, reach out to us and want to know, hey, what's the status of this patient? We haven't seen them in a while. Can y'all give us an update? But in order to do that, we would need data sharing agreement because of the sensitivity of that information. And we also wanted to develop a standard operating procedure. Like many organizations, we tend to have a lot of staff turnover. So it's in the event that happens or continues to happen, we wanna make sure that we do have something in place so the next person can come in and actually know what the operating procedure was for their certain task. Next slide, please. So throughout this project, we had three working groups. We had the data warehouse working group, the Tableau dashboard working group, and then of course the data to care working group. Like I previously said, the data warehouse was basically trying to make a comprehensive patient profile. So again, we pull information from EHARS, ALMBS, Ramsell, Hades, and CareWare for information on one patient. So to get all those different variables into one system, so when we do a search for that patient, we can see everything at one time. The Tableau dashboard, basically, like I said, was us trying to present our data or make it more public facing. It was basically all of our aggregate statistics from incidents, pre prevalence, I'm sorry, our cumulative data, our care status, our continuum, continuum of care status, and then also our prevention um, services. And then also we wanted to do a geographical or provide geographical information as far as our most dense populations. And again, where um, our care locations are at for our HIV patients that are trying to receive care. And lastly, it was our data to care 
project, which is basically re-engaging people back into care. So we wanted to make sure that we established those CBO or data sharing agreements with our CBO so they can help us get these patients re-engaged into care, which will also help with our data quality to fill in missing pieces of information as far as county, transmission mode, or any other outliers that we have not been able to capture previously. Next slide, please. So accomplishments. We were able to actually build the data warehouse. We were able to have the integrated patient profile. So now we are able to reach out to our IT team and say, hey, we need to look up so-and-so. Can you send us everything that we have on this patient? We are almost there with the Tableau dashboard. Um, hopefully within the next few months, it, I'm sorry, it will be public facing. So anybody that goes to our website can see all our data. It will not be presented as real-time data because obviously data changes time to time, but it will be based off of a frozen data set. Um, standard operating procedures is also in development as well. So in the event we have any more staff turnover, anybody that comes behind us can know how our system operates and the data sharing agreement template is in progress. So these are all milestones for us. Next slide, please. Challenges and strategies for overcoming these. Uh, our challenges was staff turnover. Um, I'm number three that's taken on this role. Hopefully it's not another person, but turn staff turnover was really big in our department. Um, lack, lack of expertise. Everybody's not fluent in Tableau or SAS. Obviously division participation, getting everybody to actually attend the meetings, give feedback and actually have a hands-on role. And then of course meeting deadlines we all had competing deadlines so trying to make some of those deliverables got a little challenging at time so the strategies we put into place was intentional hiring we're aggressively trying to hire people so that we can get staff in place to help with some of these deadlines obviously making sure we provide tableau and sas training reassess our work plan to make sure that it's still attainable for us and making sure we're actually able to deliver on a lot of the deadlines that we need to make and then obviously setting attainable goals. Lessons learned and plans for sustainability. Having a sustainable staff is essential for to a successful program and Alabama also plans to have all new and current surveillance staff trained on Tableau print and all the functionalities of the data warehouse. I would now like to pass it off to the District of Columbia. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Safier Calloway. I'm the Division Chief for Strategic Information here within the HIV AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, and TB Administration at DC Health. And we will go to the next slide. So I'd like to start first with some background on DC. The prevalence of HIV in DC is 1.8% or 12,408 cases in 2019. And among our Ryan White population, 405 received outpatient ambulatory health services. HASTA is comprised of six divisions, and relevant to this project are the Strategic Information Division, which conducts surveillance and epidemiology activities, as well as houses our Data to Care team, and our Care and Treatment Division, which houses our Ryan White program. And so for the purposes of this project, the divisions came together um, out of a mutual interest for optimizing outcomes for clients and, and an interest in leveraging our existing um, MOUs around data sharing and data use so that we could collaborate better. So we had three specific goals of this project. Um, goal, the first goal, which became work group A, is to document our data systems, processes, and structures between our DC FIS, which is our integrated surveillance system, and EHARS, which is our HIV specific data system. The second work group um, organized around our second goal which is to define parameters and mechanisms for data sharing between the two divisions. And then our third work group was around the development of synergy between our divisions with um, specific interest in data to care efforts. So as far as the activities of each of those, our work, the first work group focused on the migration of data from our HIV system into our DC FIS system, which houses um, HIV, new HIV cases and STD surveillance. And so we did a process of identifying gaps and inefficiencies. We implemented a 90-day assessment, um, entering only new HIV cases into the system to make sure we had all of the variables that we needed and that the process we developed worked, we fine-tuned that process. And then we worked through our EHARS cases 
in preparation for data migration. In work group B, we reviewed data dictionaries for our surveillance data systems as well as the careware system used by our Ryan White program, developed a schedule and a protocol for conducting matches that happen quarterly between the two systems, established a secure space to share the outputs of that data match so that they could be uploaded into each system and then did some multi-layered data review. And then with work group C, we reviewed the existing data to care process and looked for ways to leverage our Ryan White team and enhance that process. And then once the final process was developed, shared that with our Ryan White providers. So as far as challenges and our strategies for overcoming them, as I'm sure you'll hear from all of my colleagues, the COVID-19 pandemic really derailed much of our plans very early on. Um, approximately half of our project staff was detailed to support the citywide response effort, which really caused us to reevaluate, reprioritize, and even in some instances, reimagine what we had planned to do in the activities of this project. Um, staffing continues to be a challenge, both for vacancies and turnovers, as well as the necessary skill sets. As we continued further on in the project, we learned that there were skill sets and things that we needed that we had not anticipated as we um, began down this road. And then specific to this project is the managing of the reporting requirements was a bit of a challenge for us. And so to overcome it, especially across our two divisions, we centralized our review for time and effort reporting and brought on an analyst into the project team that had specific experience in partner services data. So as far as lessons learned, um, creating a formal structure for our working relationship between our surveillance group and our Ryan White program was essential. There's a considerable amount of collaboration opportunities across the two divisions that we're now more prepared to be able to complete because of our efforts on this project. Um, in more specificity, we were able to really leverage our HIV surveillance lab data to improve careware data completeness. We uncovered a substantial amount of case cleaning that's needed for our EHAR system in order to actually be able to migrate it into our DC SIS system. And so while we have the variables and the structure in place, we have to make sure that the data is ready to be migrated over. And then specifically to data to care, we created a really much more streamlined collaboration process and communication structure that better incorporates the Ryan White providers into the process, which has made our data to care program much more effective. And so as far as sustainability, um, we're continuing on with our quarterly data exchanges across our EHARS or surveillance system data with our Ryan White program data in CareWare. Um, we have much more strengthened and continued epidemiology engagement with our Ryan White providers. And then our cleaning of our EHARS data is ongoing. And with that, I will pass it to Florida. Thank you. Uh, I'm Carolee Poshman. I'm uh, the CDC assignee to the HIV surveillance program here at the Florida Department of Health. So a little bit of background on why we were interested in participating in this project. Um, we were interested because we already had some regular matching occurring between our HIV and STD surveillance systems. But the data sharing and data quality checks between the systems were not very regular and it frequently resulted in inconsistent case counts between the systems. Um, we also were doing matching between our HIV surveillance system and other databases with HIV related care information in our HIV data warehouse, but that required a lot of manual staff time for review and those matched IDs were only stored in our HIV surveillance system. So while not inaccessible to other, um, other individuals who use the other systems, just not as easily accessible. And we had no data sharing, um, standardized data sharing set up between our Ryan White Part A programs and the health department, because as Anne Marie mentioned, um, our <laughs> Part A programs are not part of the health department, they're part of the county government. So our goals, we wanted to enhance our data linkage and collaboration between the HIV and STD sections. And we also really needed to build relationships and increase our collaboration between the health department and our Ryan White Part A programs. 
Um, and so one of the key parts of that, um, uh, of, of building that relationship is to also develop the data sharing agreement so that we could have sustained data sharing between the parties and ourselves. So our project activities. Um, so we used ChoiceMaker, which is a learning matching software to automate matches between our HIV care related databases and um, HIV and STD surveillance data in our HIV data warehouse. Um, we were able to enhance our STD surveillance data system to display additional HIV care data and to use HIV viral load labs to create profiles and initiate partner services. And this was to help um, create uh, cases in this STD surveillance system where they might not uh, automatically be created based on our current reporting guidelines and um, to help us with those um, inconsistent case counts so that we could sort of uh, um, make sure that both, both systems had all individuals reflected. Um, even though it doesn't seem directly related to some of the other activities, we did design a new system to document interstate deduplication activities. Um, for those who are familiar with HIV surveillance, this is our Rider and CIDR, et cetera, projects. Um, and originally, we viewed this as an opportunity to collaborate between the HIV and STD section and allow us to have a system where we could document deduplication from from either side. And while this morphed more into an HIV only um, activity, we're still going to be able to have um, a system that could be searched and viewed by um, anyone in our programs. And also we developed um, a data sharing agreement and implemented, and our, our goal is to implement it with all six of our Ryan White Party programs. And we want to initiate linkage to care activities and the feedback loop of data between the health department and the Part A programs. And finally, we would like to document all, all of the uh, procedures that we've developed for this project as well. So our accomplishments, we have deployed ChoiceMaker in our HIV data warehouse, and we have a um, review tool that is in development. Um, it should be in a testing phase pretty soon. And we also have some optimizations to the matching process that are ongoing to um, the original match is relatively conservative. And as the um, software learns more and as we provide more feedback, it will um, include more um, good matches that maybe have um, less um, standardized matching criteria that match up in, in terms of exactness of first name and last name, et cetera. But, um, give us more of those good matches and reduce our manual review process. Um, we have completed the requirements for STD surveillance system data enhancements. Um, so that's both for um, the viewing of the HIV care data and using the um, viral load labs to report cases into that system. Um, and we're waiting for other enhancements um, to the STD system to be fully implemented before um, those changes are made. Um, and our out-of-state module, which is our interstate deduplication system, um, is in development and we should be entering the test phase for that system um, as well very soon. And we've actually executed data sharing agreements with four Part A programs as of yesterday. And so that's very exciting. Four of the six have signed executed agreements. And we've already shared all the data transfer log logistics with each of the programs and we're working through some of the finer details of the data sharing. And I think one of the most important accomplishments is that we really have increased collaboration, not only between the HIV and STD sections here at the health department, but between the health department and the Part A's. Um, the relationship, especially between the Part A's and the health department was rather contentious initially, but um, we now, I feel like, have a real working um, collaborative relationship. So some challenges and our strategies for overcoming them. Um, as everyone else has, has mentioned, um, the time commitment and staff turnover um, were huge challenges for us. And while COVID was not as much of a challenge in terms of taking away staff that might work on this project, we were actually able to make a decent amount of progress um, during the initial part of the pandemic. Um, we still had staff leave and we also um, 
I think with a lot of these projects didn't realize the time commitment that would be required to to do all of the activities. And so as we went through the project and discovered this, you know, that became more of a challenge. So, you know, we just had to reallocate tasks and adjust our priorities and our timelines. And also we really had to involve staff across the programs. This started mostly as I would say an HIV with a little bit of STD surveillance um, staff involved. And we really had to, to insist that staff from other programs get involved and take leadership and ownership of the tasks. Um, legal review is a was another huge challenge for us. This is a it's a lengthy process and a lot of it is out of our control because we don't control the legal department and um, there are other priorities as well. So in general, you know, we just sort of had to keep calm about the process and just frequently follow up via email just so that they knew that we we were um, looking for progress and um, to hopefully spur on um, some activity if if the if the, the review had been stymied for a while. Uh, documentation is a huge challenge for us. We don't really have staff that uh, have either time or really expertise in documentation. And so we did hire a business analyst and we asked for a lot of assistance and templates and tools from Georgetown and other experts because um, we felt it was necessary to build those skills within our own program um, and to try to use as much help as we could get. And finally, um, IT resources are always a challenge. I think this is pretty universal. Um, and while we have an amazing um, data integration team that works so well with us, um, at various different times during the pandemic, they were tasked to do other different projects and there are other enhancements to other systems that aren't just related to this project that they had to work on. Um, but by keeping our leadership really involved in this program, we were able to have our tasks prioritized and make sure that we got the resources that we needed. So our lessons learned and our plans for sustainability. So I think number one, a good relationship with your IT and access to those resources is really essential for any project involving data systems. And also a major lesson learned was that we had to use enlist staff from across our programs to balance the workload and encourage ownership of the, the projects and the processes that we were working on. And we have plans to continue the work um, that we've set up with this project and for all the enhancements in place. So as this is a still a high priority, all of these tasks are still a high priority for the health department and we'll continue to work until they're all, all completed. And now I'll pass it on to our final state, Louisiana. Great. Thanks so much, Caroline. So my name is Jessica Fridge. Um, I serve as the STI HIV Hepatitis Surveillance Manager um, with the Office of Public Health in Louisiana, specifically with the STD HIV Hepatitis Program, also known as SHIP. Um, a little bit of background for Louisiana. We are a medium morbidity state um, for 2021. We reported about 934 new HIV diagnoses and at the end of 2021, we had just over 22,000 people living with HIV in our state. The STD HIV hepatitis program has grown over the past 12 years. Um, we started off as completely separate programs in 2010. Um, the HIV and STD uh, control program joined together. Um, and that was the first version of SHIP. Uh, the STD HIV program. And then in 2019, we absorbed viral hepatitis, so hepatitis B and C, um, added the other H, um, and so we are now the STD HIV hepatitis program. Um, we are divided up into um, about 12 units. Um, one of them is the surveillance unit, which I manage. Um, so we oversee surveillance data for HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, all stages of syphilis, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Um, we work closely with our services unit, which oversees our Ryan White programs, amongst many other um, services for person uh, living with HIV. Um, a regional operations unit, which um, 
conducts all of the disease intervention specialists, the DIS work and supervision. Um, we only have the capacity to do DIS work specifically for syphilis um, and HIV. So we do not do partner services for other STIs, um, just HIV uh, and syphilis. Um, and then we have a prevention unit. Um, obviously, they are over, you know, the prevention of STIs and HIV and hepatitis. Um, most of our funded testing initiatives and then our out of care matching for providers. Um, and so we do a lot of integrated work uh, between these units and this grant really was another opportunity to, to bring our units together um, and to try and collaboratively work uh, towards some of these goals. Next slide. So um, ship surveillance structure is overwhelming to say the least. Um, and so for years, I think four years ago, my five-year goal was to have an integrated surveillance system. We're not there yet, but we are on the way. Um, so we do have a desire for a single surveillance system, um, which includes partner services data, not just surveillance data, all laboratory data, all funded testing data, case report form information, um, basically everything uh, under one roof. Um, and what that system would replace is then list is um, all of the items listed below. Um, the ones that have a bright blue name, um, those are actual data systems that we that we use every single day. Um, so the first two are for our HIV data. So we manage um, a lab management system where all HIV data go, um, and then EHARS, uh, which everybody is familiar with, um, but that's our HIV surveillance database that then ends up talking to the CDC. Um, we have HDS PRISM here, so that's where all of our STI data go, including syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, congenital syphilis, and then all partner, service, partner services interviews for HIV exist there as well, and then obviously for syphilis. Um, our sister program, the ID EPI program, manages NBS for our state, um, not for any of the conditions that we supervise in SHIP, um, except for hepatitis B. So we do monitor hepatitis B uh, within NBS. We have a homegrown product called HEPCAT, which we built um, for hepatitis C surveillance. We have an elimination of hep C project in Louisiana. And so um, we really needed a real time, very efficient system that could have, um, capture both labs and treatment information and case information. So it's a one-stop shop for hepatitis C. We have an access database, not sure how many people still use those, but we have an access database for all of our negative data. So Louisiana has a law um, that all HIV, hep C, and syphilis labs, regardless of test result, are mandated for reporting. So that does mean every negative screening test is reported to our office which is an enormous volume. After 18 months, we de-identify those labs and store them in an access database for assessing screening rates. Um, we have a testing manager, which is yet another access database um, where we have all of our funded tests and their related case information. Um, and then the desire is also to replace all the ways in which we match these data. So we currently use a combination of SAS programs and Link King to match data across different systems and to assess co-infections. Um, we also use a number of SAS programs to then pull all of this data and dump it into our um, linkage to care databases. So we do linkage to care for HIV. We do linkage to care for people treat, um, who require treatment for hep C. And then we also do linkage um, for women diagnosed with syphilis while pregnant. Um, and so we have to pull data from all of these surveillance systems into those three systems um, in order for linkage staff to be able to go out and do their work. So we had four main goals kind of when we started. Um, the first one was really to integrate our surveillance data, our HIV surveillance data with our STI surveillance data. So to get the data out of EHARS and into PRISM in a routine automatic way. Um, we also wanted to replace our linkage to care database. So again, we have three separate ones currently for HIV, hep C and congenital syphilis, women diagnosed with syphilis while pregnant. Um, and then we also wanted to incorporate Ryan White variables where it made sense. Um, we wanted to enhance our documentation for all of our data management, surveillance and lab systems, and then investigate future solutions that could replace all of those systems. 
And then we wanted to create a more streamlined approach for how we conduct surveillance data matches with our HIV care providers. We have long established processes where we will do out of care matches for other, other providers um, who wanna clean up their lists of, of who they've determined are out of care. Um, but we really did not have any structure in place um, to provide to folks um, and to keep it efficiently moving in house. Next slide. So our four goals are in these blue boxes across the top, so I don't need to read those again, but the first one about integrating HIV into PRISM. So we work directly with HDS PRISM staff to create a daily export out of EHARS and then an import into PRISM. It took us months to get through historical data, so we uploaded all of EHARS into PRISM, um, even persons that were deceased um, or we hadn't seen in a long time. Um, and then we do daily ongoing QC. Um, we have found that PRISM is a great way to identify duplicates in our EHAR system uh, because we will, you know, send a person into PRISM and PRISM recognizes that it is actually a duplicate of somebody we have sent previously. We also store EHAR you know, in PRISM, which allows us to do really efficient matches back to EHARs. Um, in order to replace our ship linkage and care databases, we actually worked with um, Florida, with Kara Lee, and we procured the HIV linkage module from Florida that they had built. Um, and then we're restructuring it to be able to use for multiple diseases. Again, we need to be able to link, um, do linkage work for hepatitis C, HIV, and congenital syphilis. So we're sort of cracking it open and using it for multiple conditions. Um, and then we've also crosswalked our Ryan White variables to see which ones are of interest um, to bring over into our linkage system. Um, in order to, you know, enhance our documentation and look at future solutions, we've hired a business analyst. Um, we, that, that person conducted a review of all of our ship uh, surveillance data and lab systems, um, and then also did an analysis of integrated surveillance systems across the nation to see what might work well for, for Louisiana. And then finally, when we talked about streamlining um, our out of care matches, we ended up creating um, standard operating procedures, frequently asked question sheets, fake data tables. Um, with legal, we generated a data sharing agreement um, to cover the matches. We have drafted and then finalized a SAS program that all um, that can run all of the matches. And so in the data sharing agreement, it does specify exactly uh, what variables have to be sent to us in what format so that we don't have to recreate the SAS program every time. Um, we've done uh, training and QA lunch and learn sessions um, on all of those materials with different uh, HIV care providers so that um, we can then get those DSA signed um, and create uh, the data sharing and the matches for other providers. Next slide. Um, so challenges, it's the same as everybody else, COVID-19 and staffing. Um, our first in-person Louisiana site kickoff meeting for this grant was scheduled for March 16th of 2020. If that date looks familiar to anybody, it's because essentially the entire nation shut down that week. Um, so we didn't have it in person. We had to move on Zoom and try and have a meeting while also figuring out um, all of the other things that we needed to accomplish uh, in order to start working from home. And um, I'm not sure that we were fully mentally present. Um, we've also had a lot of significant change in leadership and surveillance positions um, at SHIP. We had a lot of surveillance staff and other staff deployed um, to multiple months of COVID-19 work off and on. We've um, hired two different business analysts at this point, um, and it's actually currently a vacant position yet again. Um, I think there's a lot of challenges with hiring a role like this for public health um, and meeting both salary requirements and sort of complexity needs that uh, a role like this might uh, desire. Um, and then I think just maintaining motivation throughout the pandemic. We've um, you know, had a lot of ebbs and flows in terms of um, the, the motivation and the capacity we've had to really focus on big picture items um, and not just on sort of the day-to-day -day low hanging fruit. Next slide. So we've had a ton of successes though. Um, we have efficient, wonderful matching now between our HIV and our STI data. 
DEIS are aware of co-infection. So if they have a syphilis case and the HIV case matches, they can go out and have a conversation um, about both conditions at the same time. Um, the data matches have improved data quality between both systems. We find duplicates. We find name changes, address updates, risk information, gender identity information that update um, both systems back and forth. Um, we've made great progress to replacing our ship linkage to care databases that are currently housed in access. We do have a legally reviewed and approved um, data sharing agreement for agencies to conduct out of care matching um, with our office. Um, and we have the capacity now to expand that offer to as many agencies across the state as would like to participate with us um, because we have built these FAQs um, and these really efficient in-house practices. Um, and I think one of the greatest successes is just connecting with other states. Um, we have had a lot of conversations with well over seven or eight states about their plans for integrated surveillance systems or the systems that they currently have and why they like them, why they don't. Um, I think the business analyst did, you know, help us really move forward and decide on a future state uh, for Louisiana. We just need to keep pushing to get ourselves there. Um, and then I think just, uh, you know, I think collaborating with other states also that are part of this part of this project, um, especially with Florida, where we were able to learn about their um, linkage module. Next slide. And so for our continued efforts, we need to finalize our linkage module. We need to continue to integrate our Ryan White data um, into that linkage database and really understand um, uh, and make sure we have the true picture of, of folks that are out of, of care um, and who need, you know, have the greatest need for our linkage efforts. Um, we need to enhance our co-infection analyses now that our data are a little bit better coordinated. Um, we need to expand our out of care matching for our providers and really um, open open our doors and allow more providers um, to match with our state. We need to transition to a singular integrated surveillance system. That's that's the goal. Um, I think it will happen, um, but it is taking you know a good amount of time. Um, and then we need to continue to main the, uh, maintain strong partnerships between ships units. Um, towards a common goal of improved data integration. And I think um, this grant really allowed us to, to get that baseline, that foothold in place um, so that we could move forward. Um, I think those are all my slides. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jane Fox to talk about evaluation findings. Thanks, Jessica. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up um, with our evaluation findings. Uh, my name is Jane Fox. I'm a principal associate at APT Associates, and I am the principal investigator for this evaluation contract. So the purpose of the evaluation contract really um, was to be an outside evaluator who would design and pilot and conduct an evaluation, um, really looking at the achievement and the effectiveness of this project's objectives and activities and then ultimately disseminate the findings on behalf of HRSA um, to promote replicability of the project interventions. So, you know, really in a project um, such as this, collaboration has been key. Uh, we work very closely with uh, the HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau and our uh, project uh, officers there. We have constant um, bi-directional communications with our colleagues at Georgetown University. And then we're um, in uh, constant communication with the four participating jurisdictions. Uh, so a an, an quick evaluation overview. So we had five aims uh, for this evaluation. The first is describe the TA, look at to what extent um, was the TA provided as planned and how did it meet the jurisdiction's needs. We then assessed the extent that the demonstration project impacted the data linking processes within the participating jurisdictions. We assessed what extent the demonstration project had the intended impact on client and policy outcomes. We then also conducted a cost analysis and we're now in the process of disseminating the key findings to HRSA, to the TAP, and then uh, to inform future decision making. Here you see our approaches 
and uh, as well as our data sources. So key findings. The first key finding really is the adaptations to the technical assistance. The original technical assistance plans focused on the technical aspects of the data linkage, uh, gaining buy-in and developing collaborations within jurisdictions was necessary as a first step. The first year of TA really included substantial efforts to get buy-in and stakeholders on board and um, coordination happening. And you've heard that both from our colleagues um, at the top as well as at each one of the jurisdictions. And this all proved very challenging, especially with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we had to, to shift and, and adaptations needed to occur. So timelines shifted. Uh, there were activities that were delayed um, as you heard, one of the key things was that, that it required everyone be flexible with the timelines and the implementation of TA activities. Um, and sometimes the adaptations occurred with the implementation. Some activities happened before others just to keep things moving while we were in um, this, this moment of adaptations due to the, the pandemic. Um, much of the work, as you've heard, were converted to virtual interactions. And the TAP staff really took on a greater role to assist addressing gaps in some of the jurisdictions. And sometimes this meant helping with project management, um, writing code to link the data, and then also assisting with the evaluation reporting. So, you know, here's a nice little quote from one of our, our jurisdictions points of contact. Um, we did have to stop what we were doing with a lot of EPIs and focus on the COVID response for the beginning of the pandemic. It was challenging to work the COVID cases and also do our regular work and it did slow things down. So the technical assistance did meet the jurisdictions needs. Uh, jurisdiction staff described a positive experience with the TA. Uh, TA provided the work plans, the timelines, and it really created a framework of accountability for achieving milestones. And it kept folks on track in, uh, in moving towards achieving their goals. Some jurisdiction staff reported having trouble keeping up with the activities, of course, um, given reduced staff capacity due to the pandemic. And here are three quotes um, that you can see from our, our qualitative work. Um, without having the structure, we would probably continue to a certain degree to just be stuck in our previous processes. Uh, the TA brought a large group of us together to work on projects that we had put on the back burner. And finally, uh, we got as much as we could manage during the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic, teleworking, and we lost 50% of staff in turnover. So um, as you heard, each, uh, each jurisdiction created a work group document. This is an example um, that was uh, created uh, for the one of the working group discussions. Um, you'll see that, that it uh, addresses kind of what are the needed resources. Um, and it talks about the, the timeline. This, again, helped keeping people on track. Uh, and then there are some themes, you know, so what was the objective and what are the key points and activities um, that were happening? The enhanced organizational processes did help jurisdictions to develop standard procedures for data linking. Uh, mapping data flows. There was better coordination and collaboration across the teams and creating new data sharing agreements in three of the four jurisdictions, as you've heard. Um, it also helped with drafting job descri descriptions, particularly as you heard a couple of the jurisdictions um, hired a business analyst. So the work group meetings really helped us to improve the communication and also ability to create process documents um, and documentation projects and being able to lead these meetings.
Here's an example of, of data flow that was created um, by one of the jurisdictions. Um, and this was really helpful to um, identify you know, where things link together, where data flow in and out of places to ultimately help them achieve their goals of linking data. So we found that the technical assistance um, process was really focused on these seven um, categories, assessing existing systems and data sources, bringing teams together to develop a plan for linking their data, outlining the steps for matching data, developing code to merge data, troubleshooting code and the new technical processes, performing data quality checks, and then um, overall consistent and constant training and supporting of technical staff. So here you see a diagram of really the stages of where health departments um, came in um, and where they ended up in this process. So stage one, um, completely disparate HIV and STI data systems with no direct linkage between the systems. Um, and there was kind of an ad hoc um, matching of records only for reporting systems. Stage two, there were data in separate systems um, and a unique patient ID was used to link routinely um, using SAS code or other matching strategies. And then stage three is where folks really wanted to get to, which is a linking of HIV and STI data that are transferred or stored in a warehouse um, using a linked unique identifier. And then uh, data stored in a fully integrated surveillance system um, with the single disease systems being phased out. You'll see here we had uh, one health department who started at stage one and made it to stage three. Um, the, the remaining three jurisdictions started at stage two um, and are well on their way to the stage three um, piece of this project. So impact on data utilization. We did some qualitative um, surveys of end users of the data. Um, and we asked the question, in the past 12 months, have you used data that is matched across one or more data system? Was it really a change in the yes? Um, there was a change in the no. Uh, and then there was, a, you know, much more of a, of a change in the fewer staff reported that they don't know. Um, but we did, as I said, see the same proportion of staff using the linked data. We also asked, which of these data systems, if any, talk to each other or allow for data matching? More staff reported the HIV and STI systems do indeed talk to each other, and fewer reported that none of their systems talk to each other. So impact on jurisdiction level outcomes, um, particularly in, in relation to um, chlamydia co-infection, um, and uh, looking at, you know, baseline data, the early implementation, and uh, the full implementation time points. The numbers really stayed consistent, but what did change is we saw data quality improving and um, improvements in reporting capacity. And when we look at linkage to care for partners newly diagnosed with syphilis, um, we, we have some baseline data, some early implementation data for, uh, for, and full implementation data for the health department number two. Number three, we didn't have baseline and, uh, sorry, number four, we didn't have baseline. And number three, we did not have these data available. And this was, this was one of the things that we found was partner data is really difficult to capture, um, but we know that it's essential for evaluating um, and, um, and supporting data to care. So implementation costs, as I said, we did a, we did a cost analysis, and um, these are the staffing costs, 
the sub awards that were um, provided to each one of the jurisdictions, and then the total cost across the jurisdictions. And you'll see that the costs were relatively similar across the jurisdictions. Uh, in Health Department 3 and Health Department number 4, they spent a greater share of their funds on staffing um, than we saw in Health Department 1 and Health Department 2. So in summarizing in some key themes, what did, what did we come up with? Overall, jurisdictions had a positive experience with the technical assistance. It did help them move their data linkage efforts forward. Um, however, participation uh, in this initiative really took time and effort, um, and that wasn't always easy for staff to carve out. All jurisdictions did progress along their data linkage activities. And the survey results indicate more end users are aware that data are being linked and that data systems contain linked data. We were unable to detect changes in population health outcomes, but we do know that the reporting capacity and the data quality in all jurisdictions improved. And that the total implementation costs were comparable across all the jurisdictions um, but we did see differences in what jurisdictions spent their money on, um, and, and those did differ according to their goals. So implications. Better integration and use of HIV and STI surveillance data, we all know is important for ending the HIV epidemic and the goals associated with that. Projects to link data do take time and they take resources, but they do improve data quality and reporting capacity. Better data quality and tracking is essential to enhancing data to care activities and tracking of partner services still remains a challenge. Um, internally, we've done some dissemination. We produce quarterly evaluation summaries and shared with each jurisdiction um, on a quarterly basis. Uh, and each one of these summaries highlighted their accomplishments of the past quarter, um, and it also provided a data summary. External dissemination, we're doing conference presentations um, clearly here and in other conferences. Uh, we have one manuscript uh, that is on the development of implementation and outcomes measures, uh, and we've created an evaluation module that um, is posted on the Target HIV website for this initiative. So I'm going to close here. I want to thank all of my colleagues that were on this presentation. Uh, we will um, now move to the live uh, section of this, and we will take questions, comments, and discussion. And if you are claiming continuing education credit, um, you can receive your credit uh, through this activity by um, logging into this uh, website, uh, the Ryan White CDS, PESGCE.com. And thank you. Great. Joni, can you please take out the slides? And before we begin our uh, Q and A section, uh, you know, presenter, could you please, you know, um, come up on uh, camera? Thank you. So, um, you know, we would like to thank our uh, presenter for the presentation. So, at this time, we will pose question from attendees that we have. Uh, been collecting throughout the presentation. Uh, please uh, note that you may still submit uh, your question uh, using the chat feature. So uh, let's see, is there any questions in the chat box? No questions in the chat box right now, so. Okay. Uh, participant, please, you know, um, unmute and uh, come comes up on camera if you have any question. Uh, we would like to, uh, you know, to hear from you. Any comments, uh, you know, feedback from our presentation on our project.
So I just want to remind you that uh, you know one of our uh, presenter, uh, Brittany, is uh, unable to join our hearing and section, but uh, we have a, a very from the VC DOS is available to you know to answer any question uh, regarding the DOS VC DOH uh, project activities. no questions so this means that uh, our presenter presented very clearly about their you know the project activities but i think that we 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 really looking forward to hear you know from you you know any comments any question and then take this opportunity because it is significant you know for us to have all of our um Presenter from different jurisdictions, from uh, you know Georgetown University and our associates uh, come together here. Uh, so I mean, this is a good opportunity to provide further information about our project. So there is a one comment from if it's no question, but a fantastic section really well organized. Thank you. Thank you. So if you don't have any question right now, maybe you may have some question later. Um, anyone to you know connect with our presenters? I will you know uh, share with you uh, you know uh, our presenters' emails uh, through the chat box. So you know you just in case you have uh, any question or and you know anything that you want to discuss further with uh, any one of the, our presenters. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, so no question. Great. So um uh, I just move on to the next um uh, uh section. So just want to say thank you everyone for your participation today. And it's part of uh, the HIVS Bureau's efforts to provide you with the timely topics and the interesting speakers. We appreciate your filling out the section evaluation at the end of the this section. If you are uh, seeking the continued education credits, we complete the additional evaluation for the credit. Uh, to access uh, this evaluation, we will return to the section page within the platform and click on uh, the blue evaluation link. And uh, thanks again for your uh, participation. So, you know, with that, I We'll conclude our you know, section today and thank you. Thanks again, our presenter and also the participant participants. And also especially I, I would like to, you know, um, especially thanks uh Lori Rory and the uh, NPO technical assistant for you know this uh, section. So thank you all. <laughs>